Section 21 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 21. The Argonauts. Part 6. How the Argonauts Were Driven into the Unknown Sea. So they fled away in haste to the westward. But Aetes manned his fleet and followed them. And Lynceus the quick-eyed saw him coming, while he was still many a mile away, and cried, I see a hundred ships, like a flock of white swans, far in the east. And at that they rode hard, like heroes, but the ships came nearer every hour. Then Medea, the dark witch-maiden, laid a cruel and cunning plot. For she killed Absurdus, her young brother, and cast him into the sea, and said, Ere my father can take up his corpse and bury it, he must wait long, and be left far behind. And all the heroes shuddered, and looked at one another for shame. Yet they did not punish that dark witch-woman, because she had won for them the golden fleece. And when Aetes came to the place, he saw the floating corpse, and he stopped a long while, and bewailed his son, and took him up and went home. But he sent on his sailors towards the westward, and bound them by a mighty curse. Bring back to me that dark witch-woman, that she may die a dreadful death, but if you return without her, you shall die by the same death yourselves. So the Argonauts escaped for that time, but Father Zeus saw that foul crime, and out of the heavens he sent a storm, and swept the ship far from her course. Day after day the storm drove her, amid foam and blinding mist, till they knew no longer where they were, for the sun was blotted from the skies. And at last the ship struck on a shoal, amid low isles of mud and sand, and the waves rolled over her and through her, and the heroes lost all hope of life. Then Jason cried to Hera, Fair queen, who hast befriended us till now, why hast thou left us in our misery to die here among unknown seas? It is hard to lose the honour which we have won with such toil and danger, and hard never to see Hellas again, and the pleasant bay of Pagasai. Then out and spoke the magic bow which stood upon the Argo's beak. Because Father Zeus is angry, all this has fallen on you for a cruel crime has been done on board, and the sacred ship is foul with blood. At that some of the heroes cried, Medea is the murderess, let the witch-woman bear her sin and die. And they seized Medea, to hurl her into the sea, and atone for the young boy's death. But the magic bow spoke again, Let her live till her crimes are full, vengeance waits for her, slow and sure. But she must live, for you need her still. She must show you the way to her sister Circe, who lives among the islands of the west. To her you must sail, a weary way, and she will cleanse you from your guilt. Then all the heroes wept aloud when they heard the sentence of the oak, for they knew that a dark journey lay before them, and years of bitter toil. And some upbraided the dark witch-woman, and some said, Nay, we are her debtors still, Without her we should never have won the fleece. But most of them bit their lips in silence, for they feared the witch's spells. And now the sea grew calmer, and the sun shone out once more, and the heroes thrust the ship off the sandbank, and rode forward on their weary course, under the guiding of the dark witch-maiden, into the wastes of the unknown sea. Whither they went I cannot tell, nor how they came to Circe's isle, some say they went to the westward, and up the Ister stream, the Danube. And so came into the Adriatic, dragging their ship over the snowy Alps. And others say that they went southward, into the Red Indian Sea, and past the sunny lands where spices grow, round Ethiopia toward the west, and that at last they came to Libya, and dragged their ship across the burning sands, and over the hills into the Syrtes, where the flats and quicksands spread for many a mile, between rich Cyrene and the lotus-eater's shore. But all these are but dreams and fables, 
and dim hints of unknown lands. But all say that they came to a place where they had to drag their ship across the land nine days with ropes and rollers, till they came into an unknown sea. And the best of all the old songs tells us how they went away toward the north, till they came to the slope of Caucasus, where it sinks into the sea, and to the narrow Cimmerian Bosphorus, between the Crimea and Circassia, where the Titan swam across upon the bull, and thence into the lazy waters of the still Maetid Lake, the Sea of Azov. And thence they went northward ever, up the Tanais, which we call Don, past the Joloni and the Saromatai, and many a wandering shepherd tribe, and the one-eyed Aramaspi, of whom the old Greek poets tell, who steal the gold from the griffins in the cold Raphaean hills. The Ural Mountains. And they passed the Scythian archers, and the Tauri who eat men, and the wandering Hyperborei, who feed their flocks beneath the pole star, until they came to the northern ocean, the full dead Cronian Sea, the Baltic. And there Argo could move on no longer, and each man clasped his elbow, and leaned his head upon his hand, heartbroken with toil and hunger, and gave himself up to death. But brave Ancaios, the helmsman, cheered up their hearts once more, and bade them leap on land, and haul the ship with ropes and rollers for many a weary day, whether over land or mud or ice I know not, for the song is mixed and broken like a dream. And it says next how they came to the rich nation of the famous long-lived men, and to the coast of the Sumerians, who never saw the sun buried deep in the glens of the snow mountains, and to the fair land of Hermione, where dwelt the most righteous of all nations, and to the gates of the world below, and to the dwelling-place of dreams. And at last Ancaios shouted, Endure a little while, brave friends, the worst is surely past, for I can see the pure west wind ruffle the water, and hear the roar of ocean on the sands. So raise up the mast, and set the sail, and face what comes like men. Then out spoke the magic bow. Ah, would that I had perished long ago, and been overwhelmed by the dread blue rocks beneath the fierce swell of the Euxine. Better so than to wander for ever, disgraced by the guilt of my princes. For the blood of Absyrtus still tracks me, and woe follows hard upon woe. And now some dark horror will clutch me, if I come near the Isle of Iern, Britain. Unless you will cling to the land, and sail southward and southward for ever, I shall wander beyond the Atlantic, to the ocean which has no shore." Then they blessed the magic bow, and sailed southward along the land. But ere they could pass Iern, the land of mists and storms, the wild wind came down, dark and roaring, and caught the sail, and strained the ropes. And away they drove twelve nights, on the wide, wild western sea, through the foam and over the rollers, while they saw neither sun nor stars. And they cried again, We shall perish, for we know not where we are. We are lost in the dreary damp darkness, and cannot tell north from south. But Lincius the long-sighted called gaily from the bows, Take heart again, brave sailors, for I see a pine-clad isle, and the halls of the kind earth mother, with a crown of clouds around them. But Orpheus said, Turn from them, for no living man can land there. There is no harbour on the coast, but steep-walled cliffs all round. So Ancaios turned the ship away, and for three days more they sailed on, till they came to Aiaia, Circe's home, and the fairy island of the west. And there Jason bid them land, and seek out for any sign of living man. And as they went inland, Circe met them, coming down toward the ship. And they trembled when they saw her, for her hair and face and robes shone like flame. And she came and looked at Medea, and Medea hid her face beneath her veil. And Circe cried, Ah, wretched girl, have you forgotten all your sins that you come hither to my island, where the flowers bloom all the year round? Where is your aged father and the brother whom you killed? Little do I expect you to return in safety with these strangers whom you love. 
I will send you food and wine, but your ship must not stay here, for it is foul with sin, and foul with sin its crew. And the heroes prayed her, but in vain, and cried, Cleanse us from our guilt. But she sent them away and said, Go on to Malaya, and there you may be cleansed and return home. Then a fair wind rose, and they sailed eastward, by Tartessus on the Iberian shore, till they came to the pillars of Hercules and the Mediterranean Sea. And thence they sailed on through the deeps of Sardinia, and past the Ausonian islands, and the capes of the Tyrrhenian shore, till they came to a flowery island upon a still, bright summer's eve. And as they neared it, slowly and wearily, they heard sweet songs upon the shore. But when Medea heard it, she started and cried, Beware, all heroes, for these are the rocks of the sirens. You must pass close by them, for there is no other channel. But those who listen to that song are lost. Then Orpheus spoke, the king of all minstrels. Let them match their song against mine. I have charmed stones and trees and dragons. How much more the hearts of man! So he caught up his lyre, and stood upon the poop, and began his magic song. And now they could see the sirens on Anthemusa, the flowery isle, three fair maidens sitting on the beach, beneath a red rock in the setting sun, among beds of crimson poppies and golden asphodel. Slowly they sung and sleepily, with silver voices, mild and clear, which stole over the golden waters, and into the hearts of all the heroes, in spite of Orpheus's song. And all things stayed around and listened. The gulls sat in white lines along the rocks. On the beach great seals lay basking, and kept time with lazy heads. While silver shoals of fish came up to hearken, and whispered as they broke the shining calm. The wind overhead hushed his whistling, as he shepherded his clouds toward the west and the clouds stood in mid-blue, and listened dreaming like a flock of golden sheep. And as the heroes listened, the oars fell from their hands, and their heads drooped on their breasts, and they closed their heavy eyes, and they dreamed of bright still gardens, and of slumbers under murmuring pines, till all their toil seemed foolishness, and they thought of their renown no more. Then one lifted his head suddenly, and cried, what use in wandering for ever? Let us stay here and rest a while. And another, Let us row to the shore and hear the words they sing. And another, I care not for the words, but for the music. They shall sing me to sleep, that I may rest. And Butes, the son of Pandion, the fairest of all mortal men, leapt out and swam toward the shore, crying, I come, I come, fair maidens, to live and die here, listening to your song. Then Medea clapped her hands together and cried, Sing louder, Orpheus, sing a bolder strain. Wake up these hapless sluggards, or none of them will see the land of Hellas more. Then Orpheus lifted his harp, and crashed his cunning hand across the strings, and his music and his voice rose like a trumpet through the still evening air. Into the air it rushed like thunder, till the rocks sang and the sea, and into their souls it rushed like wine, till all hearts beat fast within their breasts. And he sung the song of Perseus, how the gods led him over land and sea, and how he slew the lothi Gorgon, and won himself a peerless bride, and how he sits now with the gods upon Olympus, a shining star in the sky, immortal with his immortal bride, and honoured by all men below. So Orpheus sang, and the sirens answering each other across the golden sea, till Orpheus's voice drowned the sirens, and the heroes caught their oars again. And they cried, We will be men like Perseus, and we will dare and suffer to the last. Sing us his song again, brave Orpheus, that we may forget the sirens and their spell. And as Orpheus sang, they dashed their oars into the sea, and kept time to his music, as they fled fast away, and the sirens' voices died behind them, in the hissing of the foam along their wake. But Butes swam to the shore, and knelt down before the sirens, and cried, Sing on, sing on! But he could say no more, 
for a charmed sleep came over him, and a pleasant humming in his ears, and he sank all along down the pebbles, and forgot all heaven and earth, and never looked at that sad beach around him, all strewn with the bones of men. Then slowly rose up those three fair sisters, with a cruel smile upon their lips, and slowly they crept down toward him, like leopards who creep upon their prey, and their hands were like the talons of eagles, as they stepped across the bones of their victims to enjoy their cruel feast. But fairest Aphrodite saw him from the highest Idalian peak, and she pitied his youth and his beauty, and leapt up from her golden throne, and like a falling star she cleft the sky, and left a trail of glittering light, till she stooped to the isle of the sirens, and snatched their prey from their claws. And she lifted beauties as he lay sleeping, and wrapped him in a golden mist, and she bore him to the peak of Lilibaeum, and he slept there many a pleasant year. But when the sirens saw that they were conquered, they shrieked for envy and rage, and leapt from the beach into the sea, and were changed into rocks until this day. Then they came to the straits of Lilibaeum, and saw Sicily, the three-cornered island, under which Enceladus the giant lies groaning day and night, and when he turns the earth quakes, and his breath bursts out in roaring flames from the highest cone of Etna, above the chestnut woods. And there Charybdis caught them in its fearful coils of wave, and rolled mast high about them, and spun them round and round, and they could go neither back nor forward while the whirlpool sucked them in. And while they struggled, they saw near them, on the other side of the strait, a rock stand in the water, with a peak wrapped round in clouds, a rock which no man could climb, though he had twenty hands and feet, for the stone was smooth and slippery, as if polished by man's hand, and halfway up a misty cave looked out toward the west. And when Orpheus saw it, he groaned, and struck his hands together. And, little will it help to us, he cried, to escape the jaws of the whirlpool, for in that cave lies Scylla, the sea-hag with the young whelp's voice. My mother warned me of her ere we sailed away from Hellas. She has six head and six long necks, and hides in that dark cleft. And from her cave she fishes for all things which pass by, for sharks and seals and dolphins, and all the herds of Amphitrite. And never ship's crew boasted that they came safe by her rock, for she bends her long necks down to them, and every mouth takes up a man. And who will help us now? For Hera and Zeus hate us, and our ship is foul with guilt. So we must die, whatever befalls. Then out of the depths came Thetis, Peleus's silver-footed bride, for love of her gallant husband, and all her nymphs around her, and they played like snow-white dolphins, diving on from wave to wave before the ship, and in her wake and beside her as dolphins play. And they caught the ship, and guided her, and passed her on from hand to hand, and tossed her through the billows, as maidens toss the ball. And when Scylla stooped to seize her, they struck back her ravening heads, and foul Scylla whined, as a whelp whines, at the touch of their gentle hands. But she shrank into her cave affrighted, for all bad things shrink from good, and Argo leapt safe past her, while a fair breeze rose behind. Then Thetis and her nymphs sank down to their gardens of green and purple, where live flowers of bloom all the year round, while the heroes went on rejoicing, yet dreading what might come next. After that they rode on steadily for many a weary day, till they saw a long high island, and beyond it a mountain land, and they searched till they found a harbor, and there rode boldly in. But after a while they stopped and wondered, for there stood a great city on the shore, and temples and walls and gardens, and castles high in air upon the cliffs and on either side they saw a harbour with a narrow mouth, but wide within, and black ships without number, high and dry upon the shore. Then Ancaeus the wise helmsman spoke, What new wonder is this? I know all isles and harbours and the windings of all the seas, and this should be Corsira, 
where a few wild goat herds dwell. But whence come these new harbors and the vast works of polished stone? But Jason said, They can be no savage people. We will go in and take our chance. So they rowed into the harbor, among a thousand black-beaked ships, each larger far than Argo, toward a quay of polished stone. And they wondered at that mighty city, with its roofs of burnished brass, and long and lofty walls of marble, with strong palisades above. And the quays were full of people, merchants and mariners and slaves, going to and fro with merchandise among the crowd of ships. And the heroes' hearts were humbled, and they looked at each other and said, We thought ourselves a gallant crew when we sailed from Iokos by the sea. But how small we look before this city, like an ant before a hive of bees. Then the sailors hailed them roughly from the quay. What men are you? We want no strangers here, nor pirates. We keep our business to ourselves. But Jason answered gently, with many a flattering word, and praised their city and their harbor, and their fleet of gallant ships. Surely you are the children of Poseidon, and the masters of the sea, and we are but poor wandering mariners, worn out with thirst and toil. Give us but food and water, and we will go on our voyage in peace. Then the sailors laughed and answered, Stranger, you are no fool. You talk like an honest man, and you shall find us honest too. We are the children of Poseidon, and the masters of the sea. But come ashore to us, and you shall have the best that we can give. So they limped ashore, all stiff and weary, with long ragged beards and sunburnt cheeks, and garments torn and weather-stained, and weapons rusted with the spray, while the sailors laughed at them, for they were rough-tongued, though their hearts were frank and kind. And one said, These fellows are but raw sailors, they look as if they had been seasick all the day. And another, their legs have grown crooked with much rowing, till they waddle in their walk like ducks. At that, Idas the rash would have struck them, but Jason held him back, till one of the merchant kings spoke to them, a tall and stately man. Do not be angry, strangers. The sailor boys must have their jest, but we will treat you justly and kindly, for strangers and poor men come from God and you seem no common sailors by your strength and height and weapons. Come up with me to the palace of Alcinous, a rich sea-going king, and we will feast you well and heartily, and after that you shall tell us your name. But Medea hung back and trembled, and whispered in Jason's ear, We are betrayed, and are going to our ruin, for I see my countrymen among the crowd, dark-eyed colchi in steel mail shirts, such as they wear in my father's land. It is too late to turn, said Jason, and he spoke to the merchant king. What country is this, good sir, and what is this new-built town? This is the land of the Phaeaces, beloved by all the immortals, for they come hither and feast like friends with us, and sit by our side in the hall. Hither we came from Liburnia to escape the unrighteous Cyclops, for they robbed us, peaceful merchants, of our hard-earned wares and wealth. So Nausithus, the son of Poseidon, brought us hither, and died in peace, and now his son Alcinous rules us, and Arete, the wisest of queens. So they went up across the square, and wondered still more as they went, for along the quays lay in order great cables and yards and masts, before the fair temple of Poseidon, the blue-haired king of the seas. And round the square worked the shipwrights, as many in number as ants, twining ropes and hewing timber, and smoothing long yards and oars. And the Minoway went on in silence through clean white marble streets, till they came to the hall of Alcinos, and they wondered then still more, for the lofty palace shone aloft in the sun, with walls of plated brass, from the threshold to the innermost chamber, and the walls were of silver and gold. And on each side of the doorway sat living dogs of gold, who never grow old or died, so well Hephaestus had made them in his forges in smoking Lemnos, and gave them to Alcinos to guard his gates by night. And within, against the walls, stood thrones on either side, down the whole length of the hall, 
strewn with rich glossy shawls, and on them the merchant kings of those crafty sea-roving phaeses sat eating and drinking in pride, and feasting there all the year round. And boys of molten gold stood each on a polished altar, and held torches in their hands, to give light all night to the guests. And round the house sat fifty maid-servants, some grinding the meal in the mill, some turning the spindle, some weaving at the loom, while their hands twinkled as they passed the shuttle, like quivering aspen leaves. And outside before the palace a great garden was walled round, filled full of stately fruit-trees, with olives and sweet figs and pomegranates, pears and apples, which bore the whole year round, for the rich south-west wind fed them, till pear grew ripe on pear, fig on fig, and grape on grape, all the winter and the spring. And at the further end gay flower-beds bloomed through all seasons of the year, and two fair fountains rose and ran, one through the garden grounds, and one beneath the palace gate, to water all the town. Such noble gifts the heavens had given to Alcinous the wise. End of section 21